Uh, good morning, everybody. It's, it's really delightful to be here because I um, adore this project and haven't quite been able to let go. It was designed as a six-month project back in 2009, and um, I've, I've kind of held on to it, and um, that's its legacy, really. For people that um, don't know where Sittingbourne is, it's sort of halfway between London and Dover, and uh, in 2008, on a site that there was deemed to be no archaeology because of the brick earthing, they found an Anglo-Saxon cemetery, Canterbury Archaeological Trust. And it was a very exciting find. It was on a, um, a housing estate, well, what is now a housing estate, and mixed development with shops and pubs. And um, the site is di divided in two. And half of it is uh, Marston's Brewery. The other half is another developer. And that half of the site has, is still waiting to be done. At the one half um, got to at least the conservation assessment stage with, um, and that was what, what, how this project was born. Um, Canterbury Archaeological Trust said, came to me. I happen to live in Sittingbourne. So I think that's another way. I just grabbed a moment that was there and, um, and had friends. A bit, the local um, head of the museum, who's now the head of the local museum, practices in a band in my garage. So it really was just a, like a coming together. I said, come look at this Anglo-Saxon sword I'm working on here. Wouldn't it be great to do this in town? So um, that's how it kind of born, was born. And so it was um, Dr. Andrew Richardson there with me from Canterbury Archaeological Trust, local councillors, the now 90-year-old um, ex-head of the local museum, the mayor, and we opened up um, CSI, so conservation science investigations is what we kind of dreamed up. And this is opening day, so it looks a little bit sparse, and you'll see on these slides over the year how much more stuff people donated to me and I've been sort of building up, um, or to the project. And I was really proud of the first um, one of this, this particular front page. Um, we've had loads and loads of press coverage. They love to come along. And, but I like that they chose, rather than the, the sparkling gold and garnet jewelry, they chose a bit that got the story of conservation and um, that we're trying to tell the story out of what looks seemingly not very interesting, but we're finding a lot of inf information out. Uh, the, the success of the project's really been a whole team effort between a lot of conservation students and interns. This is Virginia came from the Sorbonne in France, but had a lot of interns from other, most of the conservation programs. And, and the man on the right was, is a um, doctor, and uh, he used to be a breast surgeon, and his wife was giggling away because he was working on a shield boss in the roof. I, I let this, what kind of surgeon were you? It turned out to be breast surgeon, which was quite funny, but he gave up because he, he liked to use his scalpels more through soft, soft flesh rather than um, hard corrosion products, so he, he didn't stick with it in the end. He went into other kind of volunteer work with archaeology. So basically, in a nutshell, our working methodology is we're looking at the grave plans, examining x-rays, scalpel cleaning, and then um, because iron um, is a particular case, you can't clean it all the way with scalpels, you need to go to air abrasion. Now, I'm, I have put a lot of slides in here because conservators are kind of behind the scenes. A lot of you don't really meet us, I think, um, in the field. And um, we're kind of very low at the bottom pecking order and budgets. So, uh, yeah. So I thought I would just show you a little bit about what we do very, very quickly. So we, and, and, and also this is basically what I use for my tra the training for the, arch um, the, the volunteers. So we have community volunteers is what we opened the project up, but it wasn't drop-in. Um, it was, they would go through about 30 hours of really intense supervision and training, and then they would work always supervised by a trained conservator or a, um, or a junior conservator. And so we teach the, 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 the team, normally one conservator would do a whole grave themselves and track what's going on, but here we would do one grave um, a day, oh, sorry, yeah, each day had a grave assigned to it, each group, we had two shifts of people, two days a day, so there'd be like two graves you would cover in a day. No, sorry, one in a day, and, and then you would hand over, it's a half an hour handover between shifts, so four, four volunteers, we trained about 100 people over um, a couple of years. And, um, and but the point is, is to understand that, that the, how to try to look for micro details that connect finds together that help fill out the story of what's in the grave. 
and we use x-rays. If anyone's not familiar with x-rays, um, I'm sure most of you are here. So it, where it's darker is where it's thinner and more fragile. And uh, where it's wider is it's more density in there, or there's some decoration. Um, so it's both how to handle and care for an artifact, but also um, what information is in there. Some brooches, because we did have some lovely brooches. But most of the stories here we're telling is through the information in the iron. And um, the archaeologists did most of the block lifting themselves. Um, again, budget was tight, and they were trained to do block lifts, and it was quite successful. There was just two, two graves that I was brought out to help them lift on the ground, but um, otherwise they did themselves. And I hope you saw from that x-ray that having a, a block lift is so important if you've got lots of little finds um, that link together, like the chatelains I was showing. And um, in terms of volunteers, spread of volunteers, I had a visiting artist for a while who produced some lovely, so this talk is scattered with some of his work. This, these are collages from views down a digital microscope. So as I said, we started with scalpel cleaning, which is um, um, <clears throat> the, the soft layers of, of, uh, of the soil and corrosion mix. And then, um, then because iron corrodes throughout its surface, if you put pressure on it, it can just break. So you have to do apply a gentler um, schedule. And this is artistic license. We didn't aerobrate on jewelry like that, but um, I like the picture. So then, um, then we would gently aerobrate. And all of this is visible to the public. I kind of whipped through this very fast. You're, I'm sort of taking you through as if you're a visitor that wandered in. So it's, we've got the volunteers working on four-hour shifts, and then we have um, anyone in walking through the shopping mall can wander in and um, talk to the volunteers. And that's a little bit way to spread the money further by having volunteers helping. They, they can then talk to the, to the public, and they're informed because they know you know, they're so in involved with the project, they know what we're doing. Another thing that they'll, the public will see is doing the documentation, how important that is, and uh, we might talk about um, the tool marks, gilding, whatever things we're finding at the time. Now, um, we had, there was an article that went out in The Guardian that made it sound as if anyone could wander in and just um, do it and pick up a scalpel, and it, it wasn't like that. Conservators worked on um, the more precious things or things that were really difficult, but, um, and the others were, like I said, went, went through a long training program. And, um, but mainly the volunteers worked on the um, ferrous artifacts, soil blocks, and um, the model that I still stand by is really one part-time senior conservator and one full-time intern, maybe a recent graduate. It's a great place for a graduate um, to learn or an intern to learn because you see more examples. So in the short time that you're working, you see a lot more material than if you were just doing one at a time. Um, okay, so this is the main thing, is that what, 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 what's so important is to always work at the microscope and look out for mineral preserved organics. It's a magical thing that happens with metals and organic materials sometimes, that the metal, as it's corroding, the ions go into the organic material and they'll fossilize it in place. And I've never seen before this site a whole insect, but we found a, a, a wasp. I, I haven't had an entomologist tell me what it is, but there's the eyes and the face of it. And that's with a digital microscope, Keons, which is fabulous. But most of my images will be from the scanning electron microscope, and we were able to get funding from the Cloth Workers um, Trust. We used to go to, I used to go to Greenwich University and use theirs at SEM, but it's like 80 pounds an hour or so. And so we got a grant, and own, we own it with, um, or actually Oxford University owns it, rather than um, our project, but it's loaned to us. So these pictures are all taken from um, our artifacts. So this is the kind of thing you see with the scanning electron microscope. So at the microscope, you can see a change in texture, and so you know don't clean that away, and then you take it to the scanning electron microscope. This, um, I've got big images in the window of these SEM images, and this one brings to mind one of my favorite stories is the passersby and the public. Um, there were some gypsy kids that came into the door and shouted at us and said, um, what, did you find an alligator? I'm like, I followed him out, so why, why did you ask me that? And he pointed at this picture and he thought that was like an alligator skin. So then I explained, no, 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 it's a bug and it was on a belt and a grave. He's like, why is it in the ground? And I said, well, the Anglo-Saxons put their bodies in the, they, the with their clothes and the, the strayed about the, um, 
the practice. And he said, oh, that's very much like our communities. When someone dies, we burn everything. We don't want anyone to have anything. So we had this great conversation about death and dying and to them and in the past. And, and that's kind of the joy and why I can't quite let go of this project, is you never know what kind of conversations you're going to get involved with with people. Uh, fly pupa, that's, the conversation around that is sort of that, that we think that bodies were laid out for five days because the flies are able to get in. And then so it's telling you a little bit of story about the tradition. We find um, wool, linen. We weren't sure what this was, um, but in the end, we think it's feathers, and it was found near the head, so maybe a pillow. Don't know if it was a chicken. I'm not sure you can specify it that well. That's the word. Um, at the at the end, of where our funding sort of stopped was the first stage of cleaning everything, so we know what things are, and then have identified what would go on to further specialists. And so this is this was the work though of, of volunteers being, being supervised by conservators. But the volunteers have found sort of this this is out of 100 graves, 198 examples of wood, 38 with um, vegetables, fibers, um, 47 with insects from 27 graves. So maybe those are springtime graves, and now would like to go with, to an entomologist and do more work with that. Um, oh, this is just because I can't resist adding this into. This is images, a series of images from one little link on a chatelaine. Got the textile, corrosion just because it's kind of cool sometimes. Um, fly pupa. This is a bit of an insect leg, I think, or it might be something I'm about to show you. There's a bit of um, hair that's animal or human hair at the top there because of the scales. You know, it's animal hair. A little bit of vegetable, and I'm not sure if this, if you can, if this could be ID'd. Again, I need to work with archaeobotanists to see what we can do. Here's a bit, here's a bit of a leaf, which looks like, uh, I think it's a leaf because it looks like stomata. Again, I need to work with specialists um, to find out. And then there was this. Oh my gosh, I found a bug. And uh, I was talking um, again, going back to community input at a, a like conference in. Canterbury, and a woman came up afterwards because I'd said I needed to work with the entomologist to find out what this is. She says, I don't think that's an insect. I think that's a tardigrade. I'm like, what's a tardigrade? And she Googled it, and we looked at it, and I've fallen in love with tardigrades. Here's um, the claw. She said, I think those are four claws. So this is the bottom of a leg. And for those who don't know about tardigrades, they um, are in the news law. They're actually being used for um, studying. They don't die, so it's a great mascot. It's a main mascot for the project. They kind of um, dry up, desiccate, and so if you put water on them again, they can get, get alive. That's my like, get really a, na an, a nature article or something if we can bring them back to life. The oldest I know of is 200 years ago, but that's a little bit fanciful, maybe. But <laughs> the fact that we have one, and, and importantly, it tells the story that they eat moss, so it means it was moss in the grave. So that's but I tried, as part for me, just being so delighted that we seem to have found tardigrade, not one, several. And we're going to now look across the grave. Can we say whether, unfortunately, this particular grave, um, the artifacts are all in one area. But if we can say it's spread across, it's more likely to be um, stuffing in the grave rather than maybe being used for toiletry or medicinal in World War I. Once was used for medicinal purposes. So we have an empty, we have, um, we don't have any bones. I didn't say that either, it's no bones. So our project is about metal <laughs> and telling the story. We also have some beautiful jewelry, as I mentioned, and looking at tool marks is something I particularly love doing. Um, glass beads, I've fallen in love with how to make, how, making glass beads and, and, and exploring them. We have 3,000 beads. Uh, if any of you followed news in the press recently, some of them were stolen and they've been found. So. They're back. <laughs> and uh, OK, so but the legacy of the project is so I'm still there. Most of the door is locked most of the time because there's no funding. But um, I, I, so I, as an archaeological conservator freelance, I sometimes share the work I'm doing. But um, it's not economical to, to try to complete projects for people and talk to the public. And I definitely don't have the funding to be supervising um, volunteers. But there are two volunteers that still come back because they've been there from the very beginning, and I just um, want to allow them to keep going. And I know that they will stop if they you know, um, have any questions, and um, I don't have to supervise them too closely, although they would not work alone. They will only be there if I'm there. So even after eight years, 
they feel very much their place is one little part of conservation, and they're working with me. So we had a, a vet, I worked the, it's on um, the fabulous helmet that's now on display at Canterbury Museum. We held an event, Romans Revealed. We held another event for the 90th birthday party for the man who's sort of our champion, the local champion for the project, in which we, he got funding for a fundraiser, um, who then quit because local groups got mad that she hadn't raised enough money quickly because you can't raise money very quickly. So it's, it's, it's been an interesting, if anyone wants to talk to me in the future about working with small community groups and, and, and the juggling act of that. And, um, it's an, been an interesting journey. Uh, we worked on the image material. So in much the same way as before, I've, if I have an intern around, then it's easier to have the doors open. Five minutes, okay. So we did. We looked at archives for Kent Archaeological Society and found things that were dug up in the 19th century and found new, new discoveries there. So that we've kind of taken the project, seen what other kinds of collections of materials that we can work on. We went to the Eastbourne Ancestors Project, was inspired after um, they saw as we appeared on Digging for Britain and then they formed one. They have Agnes Saxon Grays with bones, so they were focused more on the, um, the bones. And um, But I brought in, and this is also just because I probably have a new audience here for don't realize about blue tack. If these, some of these are green tack because blue tack causes corrosion and can be. So don't ever use blue tacks. Um, sorry, being a conservator, sometimes <laughs> I can sound kind of um, uh, I don't know patronizing. I don't mean to be. <laughs> um, local groups we've worked with here some bit of um, gilding on some Islamic glass, and so we did I did training days sometimes there, and we had the local radio came and and. Um, uh, broadcast from there. Andrew Richardson came. This is how this is how it looked at the very beginning. So we have two shopping units. One shopping mall. One shopping unit has told this archaeological story. The other was all the conservation though, because I insisted I needed lots of space for the conservation. And uh, as of yesterday, this is how it looks. So now there's a historical research group is are are, are manning the um, one unit, and then and they've got. Ex uh, displays on World War One. Well, it's, it's, it, I'm proud of the legacy of this that it's got its own life, and so they and they do their own um, excavations and they handle the management with the landlord. So I didn't mention this the reason I'm still there is because Tesco offers us this place for free, and the local council um, let us off clean rates. So um, so that's why I'm still there and trying to explore ways to make it work because. We've, we've got it for free, and it just seems terrible to try to, to shut it down. Um, and we have got, now we're telling the story in, in the CSI lab side more. So there's one of my volunteers. He used to be in Urban Street Guards, and he's great with um, talking about Roman material. He's helping me out with um, Caesar's sword that was made on Digging for Britain this year. We're hoping it's one of Caesar's army swords. We'll see. And behind him is a forensic scientist student, and she wanted lab experience, so she wants to be a look for work for justice as a, CIS, a proper CIS, a normal CSI agent, but she wanted lab practice so to help her along. So she's working with me. We're exploring doing lab workshops, or I've been doing workshops anyways through um, our CIC. But this is a wordle of people visiting um, the exhibition. This is the that was from the archaeology side. This is from the CSI side. Nine percent of our visitors have never been to a museum before um, on one survey that we did, and yet the, the other one shows high charts. Wait, people want and have an appetite for this. We're in the lower twenty percent income bracket of the country, by the way, so it really is new audiences most of the time with three generation volunteers, and the one at the bottom. I love this um, quote she gave. She when asked about why she did joined to volunteer. It was about, you know, she's retired, so you can understand younger people and um, wanting to get experience to move on and the transferable skills that could be given. But I love this feeling that the feeling of anticipation is what CSI Project has recreated for me, the possibility of finding evidence that will be used, of use to experts compiling information about the Anglo-Saxon people, their culture and skills, fun for me and useful for the community. And in a nutshell, I thought that was just really lovely. And this is partly why she's still there. We have a waiting list of about 100 people wanting to do it, but um, I'm not so skilled at fundraising. And um, we have a Facebook site. Web the website is not very active at the moment. 
But um, this is someone just last week was in with her son, happened to find us on the day we were open, and she posted a lovely review on the Facebook page. And um, oh yeah, we had it. We got an award, an uh, international award, which was lovely. And our local MP, um, the the award was with the Acropolis Museum, which is better than winning alone. <laughs> and <laughs> then um, our local MP had um, had us as a guest. MPs can have an exhibition for five days every week. Uh, yeah, in a five day exhibition in the middle of the Houses of Parliament. So we went there. Thank you very much. Brilliant.